meeting is being held in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Laws 1975. Certification of this notice is on file in the Office of the Township Clerk. Advance written notice of this meeting was posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building, was mailed to the Burlington County Times, was filed with the clerk in the Holly Township, and was mailed to all persons who requested and paid for such notice. Please rise for the pledge of allegiance. on the agenda, ordinance number 2023-3, ordinance number 2023-4, ordinance number 2023-5, and resolution number 2023-42. Let's we'll take one each one at a time. Ordinance 2023-3 is ordinance of town council of the town of Mount Holly. Uh, and this is uh, making modifications to the D1 Central Business District of the Township Code. Reference, uh, anytime governing body, amends the township code and the amendment deals with a revision to the zoning ordinance they have to refer to the land use board for your comment review and suggest any suggested changes and also finding that it's consistent with the master plan um, that's what you basically go through with what it is it's basically really expand the uh, permitted uses in the new zone and what they're going to be doing is adding tattoo parlors which used to be prohibited and um Another, no, okay. no, okay. um, and, uh, another part of it is uh, the signage for the tattoo probably is going to be restricted to the rear of the buildings because I guess the, the front facades are more too visible. And they're going to add some prohibited uses of pawn shops, gold, and coin exchange. So they're going to be added to the prohibited list. So that's basically it for that show. Action on Ordinance 2023 3. There'd be a motion to, uh, and Tim, do you, do you recommend the board find that it's consistent with the purposes and intents of the master plan? Yes, I do. Okay. Is there a motion to report back to authorize the board secretary and in consultation with the solicitor to report the board's finding back to the governing body and to find that it's consistent with the master plan and to recommend? The adoption of the ordinance. Is there a motion to that effect? I motion. And I'll second that. Can you discuss what on this? Roll call. Mr. Banks? Yes. Mr. DePalco? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Ms. Lafayette? Yes. Mr. Stafford? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. All right, so we're going to do ordinance number 2023 4. This is the work of the Township Council, and this is um, amending chapter 149 of the land use. Code of the Township of Mount Holly to implement a cap on retail cannabis dispensaries in Mount Holly Township. So this is the same type of review. It's to report back to the governing body on this uh, minor revision to the uh, ordinance and it just puts a cap on, as you said, just puts a cap on the number of cannabis retail licenses. Yeah, basically it's going to limit to five business zones. Okay, it's, it's consistent. <coughs> More ice cream, man. Recommended adoption as is and authorize the board and find it's consistent with the master plan and authorizing the board secretary and the solicitor report back to the township committee and the clerk pending the next meeting. I'll second. Mr. Banks? Yes. Mr. DePalco? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. 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 Yes.
last ordinance on the list is Ordinance 2023-5. This is an ordinance of the township. This is adopting a single site remediation plan for the Madden's Hardware site. That's at uh, 2022 Mill Street, Block 85, Block 12, uh, and uh, 19 Church Street, Block 85, Block 42. To clarify, I spoke with Ed Fox, who's been okay. working on this one, and, and we're not ready for that one yet, so I think we ought to push on that. Okay. okay. This is just a, 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 a there is a change in the delineation of the area. It's not the actual not the plan. plan. Yeah, no, it's okay. just the delineation of the area because this is part of a larger area, and they've been able to look at this as a single site. So I think they do want to report back to the okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's, that's the change. Okay. So that is your motion on Ordinance 2023-5. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Banks? Yes. Mr. to be a resolution 2023-42. This is town council resolution support for the application of Ivy Hall to open a retail cannabis dispensary at 600 High Street in Mount Holly. For your reference, that, that's not something that requires um, land use board action. That should have been removed from the agenda. Um, that is a governing body legislative act in terms of supporting a cannabis dispensary. There's no plus or minus for this board to act upon so it should not have been included. So I would not act on that. It's not necessary. Okay. The, the licenses get voted on and approved by the state level after support from the local entities. That works. I move forward to new business applications. Um, there was application 2022-5. This is for a uh, application on 400 Mountain View Ave, uh, requesting a D1 variance to permit the existing dwellings to be utilized as a duplex. But, uh, this has been postponed to April 17th. So for anyone who has interest in application number 2022-5 uh, for 400 Mount View Avenue, the applicant is Melanie Woodson, and uh, she seeks for block 28, lot 10. This uh, application will be adjourned to the April 17th meeting without further notice or publication. So that one will not be heard tonight. We'll be adjourned to the next meeting. And next we have the applicant 2023 1, which is on the Enterprises LLC. Uh, this is for preliminary final site plan approval. This is for um, the building new Taco Bell and new 2000 pound S per foot retail building in the uh, space. Uh, that is block 127 lot 1.04 in the report zone. Good evening. Uh, Christopher Burr from the law firm of Rico Lewis and Burr here on behalf of, uh, of the applicant, uh, Mount Holly Enterprises LLC. What was your last name again? Christopher, B E R R. If, if you wanted to, could you bring the uh, display over here? Uh, you can't see anything over there. Yeah, let me uh, go. Two exhibits. One, one um, 
is Exhibit A1. It's a rendered copy of our site plan. Uh, the second page of Exhibit A1 is an aerial photo of the site in the surrounding area. And then Exhibit A2 is um, a rent or a rendered architectural elevation of the building. and extra copies of anyone. Some of the exhibits have made their way around. Um, so uh, this is an application for approval for 601 High Street, uh, which is Block 127, Lot uh, 1.04 on the tax map. Um, the relief that we seek tonight is a preliminary major site plan approval with both variants. Um, I will note our application as submitted did also seek final approval, but based on comments that we received from Mr. Alimo's office, um, we are going to hold off on the final approval at this point, um, and we'll come back for uh, final approval at a later date. We uh, do ask that the board, if we are approved, hold the application open so that we can just uh, resubmit uh, plans at that time for, uh, for final approvals. Um, with me tonight are uh, Joe DePascal, um, representative of the applicant, um, Brian Cleary from the Pettit Group, our engineer, and Nathan Mosley from Shropshire, Shropshire Associates, our traffic engineer. Um, so by way of brief overview, um, as this board knows, um, this property is located on High Street. It's uh, just uh, northwest of the Acme Shopping Center um, and right across the street from the Mount Holly Bypass. It's located in the B4 Standard Business uh, District where retail sales of um, food and goods are permitted. Um, this property is currently improved uh, with an existing Taco Bell restaurant uh, with a single drive through lane um, uh, with parking areas, signage, and associated improvements. Um, uh, the applicant, <coughs> pardon me, uh, the applicant uh, proposes to demolish uh, the existing improvements and to construct a new uh, 2,722 square foot Taco Bell with, a, with uh, dual drive through lanes and it, and an adjacent uh, 2,555 square foot retail building uh, together with parking, signage, and, and site improvements. Um, we do seek a few bulk variances as part of the application, um, which relate to um, parking areas and signs. Um, the, fir the first variance uh, that we seek is from section 149-83A to permit 46 parking spaces uh, where you're where 52 spaces currently exist and where your ordinance um, would require 104. Um, that same condition also gives rise to a variance from section 149-83B um, because the proposed area of the parking spaces is 9,200 square feet where 21,108 square feet um, would be required. As you'll hear in the testimony um, tonight, there is ample justification for that um, relief. Um, the proposed spaces are more than sufficient to meet the demand of the Taco Bell restaurant and, and the proposed uh, retail building. Um, the, the, the proposed improvements to the Taco Bell restaurant are consistent with the demand, where, uh, <clears throat> which shows that the, the vast majority of the business that goes through the Taco Bell goes through the drive through um, the, There are internal um, improvements to, with, with the with the construction of the new building, operational efficiencies um, will be put, <clears throat> will be built into the buildings to allow um, better processing of orders and to uh, permit faster faster um, 
circulation uh, through the drive-thru and will account for the fact that uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of the patrons do use that drive-thru rather than parking. Um, we also seek a variance from the requirement of 149-83C to permit a loading space. Um, again, you'll hear in the testimony tonight that a loading space is not uh, necessary operationally. Um, deliveries are currently um, managed during hours when the when the Taco Bell is not open, um, and adding a loading space here on the site would uh, provide for 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 more, for, <clears throat> for less of a, for a more um, it, it <clears throat> pardon me provides for a better site circulation and doesn't uh, require a, a unnecessary impervious coverage for a loading space. Um, we also seek a few variances for signage. Um, that we we seek a variance from, uh, from section 149-88H to permit uh, four facade signs. That's a three for the proposed Taco Bell and one for the proposed retail building. Um, the I don't think it's expressly stated in your ordinance, but our understanding of the ordinance is that one facade sign is permitted, and and so we do seek um, the relief to permit the three <laughs> signs for the Taco Bell and the one for. Um, for, uh, for the retail building. Um, we also seek a relief from that same section of the ordinance because the aggregate sign area of the signs will exceed 60 um, square feet. Um, your ordinance seems to contemplate one single facade sign out of the 60 square foot um, maximum sign area. And because uh, we permit, we propose more than one sign, we do propose to exceed that. But each each of the proposed signs uh, will be less than that 60 square foot um, maximum. Um, the the, uh, the aggregate of the proposed uh, facade signs is uh, 73.65 uh, square feet. And uh, the proposed signage for the retail building will also not exceed, will not exceed the 60 square foot, um, 60 square foot sign, sign, uh, sign area in the ordinance. Um, and finally, we seek a variance from section 149-88J to permit the proposed menu board signage for the drive through to be 25.1 square foot each, where informational signs in your ordinance are limited to uh, two square feet. Um, this variance is necessary uh, to accommodate a menu board sign. Um, a menu board sign of two square feet is simply not going to be functional, and we think that relief is justified to accommodate the, the yeah, use of, of the drive through um, We have received the review letters of your professionals. Uh, generally speaking, we will agree to comply with the commentary in their letters, um, except as noted during our testimony um, tonight. I will note that there are a few proposed changes to our plan that uh, we are going to propose as a result of those um, review letters. Um, first is that we are going to shift this northern portion of the parking lot just slightly um, to to, uh, to to make the setback of that in parking area compliant um, with, whereas as proposed currently it would I require variance um, um, <clears throat> relief for being slightly too close to the top of the line so uh, we will make that change so that that is compliant um, second um, we are going to increase the width of the sidewalk in front of the building to be six feet. That was a comment in both of the review letters that um, we received, and um, to uh, and so in order to to better accommodate uh, pedestrians going into the building, uh, we are going to widen that sidewalk from five feet to six. Um, that that change will give rise to a slightly reduced length of the parking um, <clears throat> uh, spaces from twenty feet to nineteen which that will trigger a new variance, um, but uh, we think that that variance, again, is, is uh, justified because, well, uh, for two reasons, uh, because 19 feet is sufficient for the proposed parking, um, for the use of the proposed parking spaces, and because it will better accommodate pedestrians going into the building. Um, so with those introductory comments, I'd like to call our engineer, uh, Brian Cleary. And, and just for the board's reference, I did have a chance to review the notice provided, and the notice pr provided was um, timely and specific enough in terms of the relief required, including some wiggle room for additional design waivers and variances. I know that there was a question about whether 
um, it was complete for finals because of the stormwater plan issue, but Sarah's there hunting that through another time. So we're okay for going forward with permanent move of all fairness to this Great, thank you. Um, I see Mr. Cleary, you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this board. Yes. All right. Um, Brian, I, so, um, okay, perfect. Uh, yes, I graduated from Temple University with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Uh, I've been a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey since 2013, I believe. Um, licensed in New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and I have a um, not expired license, but I'm also licensed in North Carolina. I've been in front of uh, close to 100 boards uh, and provided testimony um, for similar projects to this. And, and, and um, you're familiar with this property and with this application? Yes. And your office uh, prepared uh, these plans? Yes. Based on uh, that testimony, I would ask that the board accept uh, Mr. Cleary as a professional, or as an expert in engineering. Any questions? No, no questions. questions. Yeah. Thank you. So, can I just, before we jump into the substance, um, Oh, you were here obviously for my introductory comments, correct? Yes. Um, were those comments true and accurate? Uh, yes. The small clarification, and I'm sure uh, the board planner would also bring it up, uh, according to the board planner's review of the proposed signage, we're actually proposing six signs for the Taco Bell. Um, and so pull up the yeah. rendering. And so that's um, exhibit A3, correct? So each sign has two components to it, the bell and text. The board planner is interpreting them as separate signs. Um, we kind of typically consider them combined as one sign. However, we'll have to request the, the variance for six signs. And based upon a conversation I had with the board planner, um, the facade sign requirements are per use. So the retail technically wouldn't require a variance because we're only proposing one sign and it will not exceed 60 square feet. So just a okay. technical clarification. Okay, so yeah, so just, just to make sure I'm clear there. So the, the bell and the word mark, we're gonna count those as two separate signs. So Correct. The, so the three places on the building that appear to be two signs each other, uh, rather than one as I was uh, Correct. stating. Correct, Okay, great, great, okay. Um, now, so um, let's refer to exhibit A1, the aerial. So just, just very briefly, just uh, can you just provide an aerial and where the property is and what's there now? Uh, yes, the property is located at the intersection of Mount Holly Bypass and uh, Burlington Mount Holly Road. Um, it's located north of the Acton Shopping Center. It's currently developed as a Taco Bell restaurant with a single um, drive through um, and associated site improvement. Okay, so now just turning back to the rendering. Um, so just from a, just kind of a big picture uh, perspective as far as what's being proposed. I mentioned during my introductory comments that there is a Taco Bell restaurant that will drive through it in a retail building. Um, is that, does that accurately describe the uh, scope of proposed improvements? Yes, it does. Okay, um, so let's just talk a little bit about access to the site and then sort of the customer experience, you know, circulation uh, through the site for the Taco Bell. Uh, so access to the site, um, it, it currently exists at the intersection. We will be improving that uh, to provide new pavement, new ADA grants, new concrete apron, um, based upon the review comments from the county, which we have received conditional approval for. Um, so people would enter from that main driveway, um, proceed straight through uh, with the Taco Bell and the retail center on your left, uh, you can either park if you want to access either of those build the interior of those buildings um, or enter the tool drive through at the rear of the site um, once you um, so there's two ordering boards for each drive through lane uh, once you order you process to the rear of the taco bell pick up your food and you leave the same entry you came in 
Okay, and so um, as far as the drive through, they're, they're, well, you know what? Uh, let's do, talk about parking first. So how many parking spaces are proposed? Uh, we are proposing 46 parking spaces. Okay, and um, under the ordinance, how many are required? Uh, 104 spaces are required, and that is driven by the fast food parking requirement. Okay. Um, now, the, what, what's the actual parking um, demand for, for the existing Taco Bell? Does it approach 104 spaces? Uh, no, it does not. Um, however, I would like to defer to our traffic engineer. He performed an analysis of the existing parking demand and the drive through queuing requirements. Um, so any specific testimony regarding those two items, I'd like to defer to him. Um, but just as background, um, we do a lot of developments with this Taco Bell uh, developer. Typically for the Taco Bell, we, we range anywhere from 22 parking spaces to about 30. Um, 30 is really their sweet spot just in case anything um, in extreme demand were to happen. Uh, but I think it's around 80 to 85% of their traffic is through the drive through lane. Um, so, even with 30 parking spaces, we then have 14 available for the retail use, um, which I believe meets your ordinance requirement. Uh, it, it, it's a little short, but those, those two uses together, um, their peaks really want to intersect. Um, so, we believe the parking is more than sufficient, and as I indicated, the, um, our traffic engineer will address any specific uh, questions regarding their analysis. Okay, great. Um, so, um, what are we gonna say about parking? Oh, great, so, we, we, so at the front of the building, I mentioned that we are going to increase the width of the sidewalk. Can you put that out on the plan? Yes, so currently we're proposing a five foot sidewalk width. Um, I typically design with six foot, however, those six foot sidewalks are for um, nine by 18 parking spaces. Uh, the township requires larger parking spaces, 10 by 20, which um, I typically see either in um, um, shopping centers with uh, carts so that there's ample room between um, both cars for a cart to be able to um, make its way through or typically the longer lengths are in um, like Home Depot shopping centers or anything that requires large trucks. Uh, so the Taco Bell and the small retail, the typical customers will be smaller vehicles. Yes, you'll have your occasional truck, but it would be a, a small portion of um, the customers. So what we're requesting is to reduce the length by one foot to allow two feet of overhang onto the sidewalk. Um, with that, the same justification would be made for the remainder of the spaces to be 19 feet in length. We provide two feet of overhang everywhere. Um, so we'd be able to cut down a little bit on impervious um, for parking length that we, we just don't think is required to be 20 feet long, especially since we're providing the two feet of overhang. And, and so that, that so you mentioned a uh, nine by 18 is sort of a typical uh, dimension that you see. And so, I mean, is it uh, your experience that a nine by 18 space would be sufficient for retail use? Um, yes. Okay. And here we are providing for 19 feet away. Uh, and 10 feet wide. So we, feet we won't wide. be changing the width requirement. Okay. Um, and now, are, are we proposing <coughs> any, um, EV, any EV spaces as required under the New Jersey model ordinance? Uh, we will be providing one make ready space okay. as required by the, the state. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and I mentioned um, we're going to shift that parking area that's yep. sort of at the northwest of the property. Um, is that accurate? Yes. So we, and so that will comply with all the. Uh, yes, the parking. We will comply with the parking setback requirements of the ordinance. Okay. And uh, I believe there was a comment in Mr. Um, Alimo's uh, review letter about increasing the width of one of the spaces for the retail building to 12 feet to accommodate um, loading. 
We do not. Yes, we can provide a 12 foot lot wide loading space for uh, the retail. Okay. Great. And so we'll we'll and so as as part of any approval that you um, still can take that on the plan. Correct. And I can work out the um, location with the board of professionals. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, loading, deliveries, and trash pickup. So what? So I guess um, let's take trash first. So where? Where's the trash enclosure and how will a truck get to it? Uh, trash is located at the dead end of the main driveway into the site. Um, so a trash truck would access it via the main drive aisle and then drive around the bypass lane to exit to the access to um, Route 541. <coughs> is there enough uh, room there through that bypass <coughs> lane for a truck to navigate? Uh, yes, it, it has no issues navigating, um, even with people in the um, drive through lane. Okay. And we can provide turning templates on the plants to confirm that. Okay. Um, loading spaces. So we do seek a variance for um, not providing a loading space where one is, <clears throat> where one is required, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now, what, what, why don't we ever propose? Space. Uh, so Taco Bell uh, performs all of their loading during close hours. Um, it's a Taco Bell truck. The delivery driver has a key to the store. They'll um, come in overnight and one person will do all the loading and offloading while no one else is on site. Um, I've provided a turning template to the board engineer um, demonstrating that a WZ50 tractor trailer can can navigate around the site without any issue. Great. Um, and um, for the retail space, um, we don't know exactly what's going in there. Um, it'll be a small retail. Uh, the developer likes to do a lot of deals with cell phone providers. Um, so any sort of loading for that would be handled via the largest truck would probably be a single unit truck, but typically like a FedEx or UPS truck. So the 12 foot by 20 foot space would accommodate that kind of loading. Okay. Um, and so what, what what would the impact be if, if we were to add a loading space uh, uh, to the plan? Uh, it, the biggest impact would be um, either a loss of parking spaces, additional impervious towards the rear of the property where the residential properties abut um, this property. Um, that, that's, it, it would negatively affect um, the way this layout works regarding parking and additional impervious. Okay. And operationally, for the reasons that you mentioned, including the type of trucks that come and the hours where deliveries are scheduled, it sounds to me like there's not an operational need for a loading space. Is that fair to say? No. Or yes, it is fair to say there is not a need for a loading space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, landscaping. What's what's proposed on this site as far as landscaping goes? Uh, so we're providing a, a nice mix of trees and shrubs throughout the property. Um, we're trying to save, uh, so the rear of the property we're really not touching. There's mature trees and shrubs back there. Um, there's also a large tree at the entrance that we're keeping. Um, so we're providing what we believe is a nice landscaping package. Uh, in con consultation with the board planner, we agreed to um, provide some more evergreen shrubs to the rear, um, some evergreen trees to provide additional buffering for the adjacent um, properties. Uh, the only item that we would like to push back on is the request for street trees. Um, it, this business is really dependent upon visibility, especially with the pylon sign and the building sign, so any sort of street trees take away some of that visibility so we would if, if the board would like additional trees um, we would be happy to plant them elsewhere on the property to make up for any street trees that you may want um, but we just request that no street trees be required especially since there's none currently existing okay. would the applicant be willing to work with mr Especially since we have to come back for final, no matter what. So we'll, we'll have this. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. 
All right. Um, you mentioned the visibility of signage, so I think that's a good time to you know to turn to uh, what's proposed as far as the signs go. I think uh, you mentioned the, the pylons out on the streets. So before we get to the um, facade sign, so there's an existing pylon sign on High Street. Uh, uh, correct. Correct. And we're not changing that sign other than to uh, change the copy, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, uh, other than, than the changing copy to that pylon sign, um, they're also proposing the six facade signs on the Taco Bell, which is the bell and the word mark on three different signages, correct? Correct. <laughs> All right. Can you um, show the A3 and uh, show where, where those <coughs> signs are proposed? Uh, so, the two signs shown on this elevation um, on the tower, which is the, um, the northwest corner of the building. So one would face um, Route 541, and one would face motorists uh, <coughs> traveling the set. Um, so it would. And then the final sign is the sign shown on here, which is over the main entrance to the building. So it faces the parking lot. And so um, I mentioned, um, well, so so we need uh, variance relief for the number of facade signs, as I mentioned earlier, correct? Correct. All right, and um, as far as sign square footage goes, so the ordinance, my, my reading of it would be that, you know, there's a 60 square foot um, limit on facade signs. So we, we obviously don't comply with that uh, because I think the, oh, the aggregate uh, facade sign uh, square footage is about full. Oh, uh, what is the, the uh, square footage of the uh, facade sign? Uh, it is 73.65 square feet. Okay, so with the with the six signs on the three sides of the building, we are over by uh, about 14 seven, square feet. 14 square feet, okay. And, are, and in each of these individually, each of these signs individually, you know, they're fair, oh, would you agree they're fairly uh, modest in size? Yes, the two largest are the tower signs, um, and these combined are, I think they're about 26 or 27 square feet each. Um, for the facades that they're on, you can see in this rendering, they're, I don't believe they're obtrusive. Um, it's just they, they want as much signage in as many directions as possible while not proposing an extreme size. Um, and obviously what they focus on is the bell. If, if you see a bell, you know it's a taco bell. So they just want that um, to be as visible as possible, but they're, as indicated, they're, they're not, I don't believe they're obtrusively large at all, especially the one shown on this facade. Um, and so the, the, uh, the intent of this, you know, having these signs on the various facades is to allow the driving public to identify the building as they're passing by, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and to some extent, the the signage is you know mandated by you know there it's a national brand. The signs have to be consistent <coughs> of what's required by by that brand, correct? Uh, correct. These elevations are pretty much taken from the the Taco Bell prototype plan. Um, so there's there's not a whole lot you can. They offer you some options, but there's really not much you can change. Um, and typically signage is one of those things that you, they want you to meet their standards as much as possible. Um, and and um, I also mentioned um, during my opening that there's, there's uh, some variance of relief associated with the menu board signage. Um, and that's as to the, uh, the sign area uh, for the menu board, is that right? Yes. Okay. And so what's permitted as far as um, the sign area for a menu board, or for an informational sign? Uh, it's two square feet. All right. it's, I mean, is that going to be sufficient for a drive through menu board? No. Okay. And so, and so what, what's the menu board sign, sign area that we are proposing? So we are proposing a little over 25 square feet. It'll be about a five by five sign. Um, and that sign is actually, it'll be a digital menu board. Um, it's a lot smaller than previous iterations of the Taco Bell signage um, because they weren't digital. So they needed to show everything. Taco Bell now provides breakfast as well. Um, so there's a lot of menu items. And with a digital sign, you can rotate between um, each meal. So they're going with a smaller digital menu board so that they can only show what's relevant at 
the appropriate times that they come through the drive-through, which also helps with um, getting everyone through the drive-through lanes as quickly as possible. So there's not an information glut once you hit the menu board. And is there one of those menu boards proposed for each of the two drive-through lanes? Yes. Okay. And, and so each of those is over the 25. Yes. Uh, square feet. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, stormwater management. Um, so what? Just sort of at a high level, uh, what are we uh, proposing as far as uh, stormwater management? Um, so actually, there's a, a basin located on site. Um, it was installed. A, about 25 years ago, I believe. Um, so our plan is to propose a new basin in the same location because the current one's not functioning the way it was designed. Um, we received some, um, what I would say, atypical uh, test results for the um, soil testing. We're getting more testing done. Um, we think that the additional testing will back up the original design that we submitted. However, we have to meet the state stormwater requirements. Um, so that's the main reason we're splitting um, preliminary and final approval uh, is because if we can't get good tests in the back of the site, then we may have to relocate the stormwater system. So that'll all be worked out with the board engineer before we come back in front of you if we're granted preliminary approval. So we will meet the state requirements. Can you reiterate um, what you stated as pertains to the uh, second refill uh, space and the signage that's going to be on for that space? So that will meet the order. There will just be one facade sign that will not exceed 60 square feet. So as it, based upon a conversation I had with the board planner, it was his interpretation that you're permitted one facade sign per use, not to exceed 60 square feet. So the Facade signage for the retail use will meet the ordinance requirements. Right. Um, now, the, this exhibit A3 also, it, in addition to signage, also depicts the proposed building, correct? Correct. The top the, uh, the of the building. Um, is, that, is that rendering consistent with what the actual building is going to look like? Yes. Okay. Um, now, and, and the, 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 adjacent, the adjacent proposed retail building, that is, uh, there's not a proposed um, user yet, it's, you know, to, to be determined, but it'll be, but it'll be complementary to the Taco Bell building, yeah. as far as a uh, design for building goes, correct? Right? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the majority of this building is, is earth tone in nature. Um, the retail obviously won't have Taco Bell colors or anything like that, but it will, they'll be harmonious in um, design. Okay, other than, with, uh, with respect to the parking, loading, and sign variances that we um, talked about, it is, does this proposal comply with the other bulk requirements of the zone? Yes. Okay, building height? Yes. Setbacks? Yep. Coverage? Yes. Okay, now just to, um, I'm going to talk, you know, just a little bit more because we detailed them, you know, all the variances for you see. But I want to make sure we talk a little bit about more about the justification. So we talked about um, sort of the operational reasons why this number of parking spaces in this parking area and the lack of loading spaces are, are appropriate uh, for this use. And I, I think your testimony, uh, tell me if I got it wrong, is that you know this by not proposing the loading spaces and by not by not proposing the additional parking, we are able to provide kind of better circulation and reduce impervious coverage for, for the proposal. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, now, to, to justify um, a variance of the land use law, we have, we have to you know, show that we promote one or more purposes of zoning. You know, some of those purposes include, you know, among other things, that we promote the general welfare or that um, oh, this is going to um, help um, promote a reduction in flood conditions, uh, for example. Will, will, will the reduction in impervious cut in proposed impervious coverage help to support that goal in your view? Uh, yes, it will. Uh, less impervious means less stormwater runoff. Um, in addition, the only other place we have on the property to add impervious is to the rear of the 
property, which is closer to the adjacent residences, which we would rather avoid because um, we don't want to disturb them or impervious that we think is unnecessary. Okay, and, and um, as with respect to the loading space in particular, um, the, the, I think you mentioned it. I mean, it would essentially be, it would congest the site a little bit to, uh, to add that, that uh, loading space. I think yeah. if I have a right, that same justification I would apply that, you know, we are we are, uh, reserve, we are reducing proposed impervious coverage and trying to provide better circulation while not um, providing too much impervious here. I mean, is that uh, a fair, fair characterization? Yes, that's correct. And same justification uh, with respect to the one foot of reduction in length of the parking area or of the parking space, is that? Yes. Okay. And with the signage, um, you know, we talked a little bit of, uh, about visibility of the site. Um, I mean, are, are these signs, they're set up, they're, they're proposed in areas so that the, the driving public can identify the site, kind of make, see the site, know what it is, and make safe traffic uh, movements in the site. Is that a correct. Fair, That's correct. fair characterization? Okay. And, um, the, the, I, would, I would have a little bit about, about the modest size of the design of the signs. It, w would you agree that those signs, as proposed, you know, they're 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 consistent uh, with the with other signs in the area? Yes. Okay, and you know, designed in a way to not be too impactful, and, you know, sort of help to help to promote a sort of uh, attractive um, environment. Yes. Fair to say. Yes. Um, in your view, it. Is this a proposal as a whole going to cause any detrimental impacts to the public or to the zoning plan or to the zoning uh, um, ordinance? Uh, I don't believe so. And, and as we, you know, uh, for sure the reasons, um, for the reasons that we talked about, a reduction in impervious and um, the site is still going to operate as intended, right? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Clear, I think those are all the questions I have for you at this point. The board or its, or its uh, professionals may have some. Right. Um, next, I'd like to call. Uh, Any questions? No. Any questions? No questions. No questions. Okay. Next, I'd like to call uh, uh, Nathan Moses from Trotter Associates. Nathan, um, your office prepared a traffic assessment for this application, correct? That's correct. The, re the assessment report was dated December 19th, 2022, so it was submitted with the application. Okay. And um, I understand that as part of your study, um, you examined condition, existing conditions on the adjacent um, roadways, including the existing um, um, level of service on those roadways. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I can give you just a quick brief overview. If you do have any questions, just let me know. Um, so as far as trying to go out and establish the base conditions, you've heard some testimony already, but the existing Taco Bell obviously is located at the intersection of 541 and High Street, where the bypass comes in. So the bypass comes in, there's dual left turn lanes to go north on 541 and continue on toward West Hampton and Burlington Township. Um, two lanes in each direction on the bypass, with the exception of South County, you have an outer lane that dumps into a far side jug handle as you go around that would take you back to the intersection as well. And then north on High Street, you have two through lanes and a dedicated left turn lane as well that will allow movement from High Street onto the bypass today. So in order to get an idea on what the existing volumes were like and knowing the type of use that we have proposed with the existing and future Taco Bell, we went out and we did traffic counts, and those counts were done on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, we wanted to make sure we kind of captured the peak times of both, not only the site, but also the existing roadway conditions. So we counted on Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. to get the morning time um, information. We also counted midday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Then we also counted the evening from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. to capture that evening commuter peak coming back from work, um, anybody grabbing some dinner on the way. And then on Saturday, we counted from 11 a.m. Uh, to 2 p.m. 
what we found is that those typically represent the peak times when you look at both the roadway volumes that are out there today plus the volume from the site itself. So once we establish those base conditions and we want to look to the future conditions to see how much traffic we would anticipate that would be added to the network as a result of the redevelopment of the Taco Bell plus obviously the expansion or the add of the additional retail building next to it. So we did a combination of looking at the existing volume going in and out of the site. Uh, we also looked at a comparable site in Mount Ephraim where there's another Taco Bell facility that has a Pizza Hut located on the same property as it. And then we also looked to the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is a national organization that's done studies of retail buildings and fast food restaurants throughout the country and compiled all of that data into the trip generation manual, the 11th edition. And we looked at all of those different sources to kind of come up with a worst case you know, scenario analysis for the additional trips that would be added. Uh, in my opinion, the main traffic increase that you'll see is just a result of the new retail tenant that will be on the site. There may be some increase in traffic. Uh, hopefully, I'm sure the Taco Bell franchisee wants some more traffic as a result of the changes and improvements that are being made. Uh, but I do anticipate that most likely the traffic for the Taco Bell itself will be very similar to the existing volumes that we observed out there. Uh, they may increase slightly as it becomes more efficient with the new drive through layout. But I think the majority of the additional trips that will be added will be directly related to the retail building that's going to be proposed on site because that's essentially a new use compared to what you have today. So once we determined the additional trips that would be added, we, in, we included those into the existing volume count uh, that we had already done. Uh, we wanted to really just focus on those peak hours, the busiest times in the morning, in the middle of the day, in the afternoon, and then on a Saturday. So when we looked at all the data we collected, we really isolated it down to that busiest one hour during each of those peak periods that we counted. Uh, we also did some additional background growth to look to the future, just assuming there's gonna be additional traffic increase in this area as a result of other development. Uh, increases in population, et cetera. Those rates are provided to us by the NJDOT. They're standard based upon the location within the state and the type of roadway that you're on. Um, but we look basically to the future, we add some additional traffic, and then we compare the future conditions without any additional trips from this site, and then the future conditions with the additional traffic to see if there's gonna be any changes in what we call levels of service, and then the impact uh, as a result of the traffic from this expansion and this redevelopment. So a level of service is a way as traffic engineers that we look at the operations of an intersection, whether it's a signalized intersection, <coughs> we have here in this case, or it's a stop controlled intersection. And basically levels of service are the uh, experiences that a motorist or a vehicle traveling through an intersection has based upon delays that they experience. So level service A for a traffic signal means that you have minimal delays. You're maybe experiencing you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds of average delay per vehicle going through an intersection during those peak hours, down to a level service F where you're experiencing maybe a minute or more. You know, you're sitting there for two or three cycles trying to get through an intersection uh, under, you know, under typical peak conditions. So in this case, for the existing intersection of 541 and High Street, the existing intersection operates at an overall level service C, as in CAT, during both the AM, the midday, and the PM conditions during the week, on a weekday. Um, in this case, it was a Friday. And then also at an overall level service C on a Saturday during the peak hour as well. When we look to the future, we add an additional traffic just from general background growth, but nothing new from this site. The intersection still continues to operate an overall level of service C during all four of those peak hour conditions. And then when we look to the future again and we look at the additional traffic from our site and if there's going to be any impact from that, um, again, we found that the intersection still will continue to operate an overall level of service C during all of those peak hour conditions. The intersection itself, geometrically, it's pretty well built out. It's got multiple lanes in all directions. The county has done a good job of trying to really uh, optimize the available traffic signal to ensure that it gives the most amount of green time to the majority of the approaches where all the volume is located. Um, most of your volume is on 541 South or on the bypass itself. Um, High Street's kind of the third tier roadway coming out of Mount Holly. And then obviously the Taco Bell driveway is really kind of the, the lowest um, the lowest one on the, on the totem pole. It gets a minimal amount of green time. Uh, but again, it can still operate efficiently and effectively even with that design. And uh, we have received conditional approval from the county already. Um, they have reviewed the traffic study and everything that's been submitted to you as well. And they have issued that conditional approval. They did not have any comments related to traffic or related to any changes being required at the existing signalized intersection to accommodate the additional trips that would be resulting from this site. So I think as far as the operations are concerned, 
and our impacts from a level of service perspective, you're really not gonna see a significant change and I believe that the intersection itself can accommodate the additional trips that will be generated by this site. Then in addition to that, we also did a couple of additional studies. Um, one thing was we looked at the drive-through queuing. We looked at the existing Taco Bell uh, for, the, for the purpose of evaluating the drive-through operations. And then we also looked at the on-site parking. Obviously you've heard some testimony, we do have a parking variance that we're requesting for this site. Um, so I just wanted to speak to those two things real quick as well. So the future development, uh, as you can see here before you were proposing two order menu locations, we have an extended long single um, lane between those order the, the menu positions and the pickup window. And then we obviously have some available stacking beyond the order board itself for vehicles that are waiting to come in. So with this plan in front of you, there's a total of 14 vehicles stacked within this area. Uh, we have two-way traffic through here, and then we have one-way traffic flows around, parking here and here, angle parking around the rear and on the sides as well. But again, we have 14 vehicles stored here. So we did parking, or we did drive-through and parking counts at the existing Taco Bell on a Friday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., and then on Saturday we did we did parking and drive-through counts from 12 p.m. noon till 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and then from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. So we felt like that really captured the peak times for that existing site, which typically is the lunch time and the evening um, dinner time, and actually a little bit after your five o'clock rush, typically like six o'clock, we saw some increased parking as well and inc increase in the drive-through. <clears throat> so what we found was that during the peak hours, whether it's the middle of the day on a Friday or Saturday, or whether it's the middle of the day on a Saturday or uh, a Saturday or an evening on a Saturday, the uh, average queue in the drive-through lane, um, the highest observed was on a Friday in the evening around seven, uh, um, in the evening time, and the average was 6.3 vehicles uh, every time we did our count. We did our count every three minutes for all those times listed. So the average queue maximum was 6.3. We did see one instance where there were 15 vehicles in the queue, and that was from the, the window all the way back. Uh, again, we have 14 vehicles here. I do believe we can easily put an additional vehicle here without impacting on-site circulation. So I do believe, even if it were to hit that 15 um, vehicle queue again, that it can be safely accommodated. Um, but what we saw too was that as soon as it got really, really busy and that far out, typically it, things kind of picked up and within a couple minutes uh, at most, the queue was reduced down to 10 or less vehicles a day uh, as people went through the drive-through. So uh, I do believe that the design for the drive-through lane can safely accommodate the maximum queues and there won't be any impact to the on-site circulation uh, for somebody trying to go through the site when it is uh, at the peak time for the drive-through lane itself. And then as far as the parking is concerned, again, we did parking counts during all those times I just discussed on a Friday and a Saturday. What we saw was that the peak parking demand or the most cars that we saw on the site at any one time occurred on a Friday at 12.30, 12.30 in the afternoon. This was a combination of employee plus um, patron vehicles. And we counted a total of 18 vehicles uh, on that Friday at 12.30 for the Taco Bell itself. Uh, Friday evening, the peak, time, peak amount was 13 vehicles. Um, Saturday, middle of the day, with 10 vehicles. And Saturday evening, with seven vehicles. The averages were typically anywhere from five to about eight vehicles, uh, other than the Friday midday, where we hit 11 vehicles on average. Um, and that's parked vehicles in the, in the lot itself. So as far as the parking variance is concerned, we have about a 2,600 square foot retail building uh, under your ordinance that would require 13 parking spaces. If we add that to the maximum observed parking for the Taco Bell, which was 18, that would give us a total of 31 parking spaces anticipated for the peak demand. Again, we have 46 spaces. That, that leaves us with a minimum of 15 additional spaces on site, which is roughly 30 to 35% of our total supply. So that's a good amount of uh, available parking if there were for some reason to be an increase in parking needs. Um, but I do believe that, you know, the granting of the variance with regards to the parking is substantiated based upon the parking analysis that we've done, uh, plus the requirements in your ordinance for the retail building itself. And I think that the 46 spaces will be more than sufficient to accommodate the peak parking demand and need for this site itself. So I think that's all I wanted to touch on. I was going to ask you. Is there anything else? Could you talk about the queuing at the uh, order boards? I mean, one of my concerns was that you might get some backup in front of those retail parking spaces. Sure. So the, the order menus are, are right here, if you can see my where I'm pointing. 
um, kind of tucked up. And then beyond that, we have the kind of staffing area if you approach the uh, pickup window itself. Currently, we show three vehicles each lane from the menu board back. So we can probably easily add at least one vehicle in this area without impacting any of the parking. And potentially, you know, another vehicle would be, you know, just encroaching on maybe one or two of those spaces along the frontage. Um, this area in between, I will point out, is 28 feet, so it is an oversized um, circulation aisle in between the parking and the, and the front of the buildings, I would say. Um, typically, you have a 24-foot aisle, so there is additional room in there for vehicles to get around somebody if it were to be extended. But what I see normally is that where you want the most available stacking is between the menu board and the pickup window because typically people can be processed very quickly through the menu board. A lot of times when someone pulls up, they know exactly what they want. They order quickly and they're through. And then typically, you know, once you get them into this area, then obviously it may take a little bit longer internally to get the orders made or picked, you know, processed so that people can pick them up. But what this does is give a lot of space in here. So I do think that given the layout, um, they will be able to uh, operate very efficiently. They will be able to get people through here. Uh, and I don't, I don't anticipate there'll be extensive um, queuing back into the parking area that will impact people that are parked here. And again. Most of the parking, I would think, is going to be related to the Taco Bell and located, you know, immediately in this area. Obviously, the operator can encourage their employees to park in some of the more remote spots that will be, you know, really utilized by customers. So that will keep the primary spaces in the front of the buildings available for those customers that are going to be coming in and out. Was there any indication on where uh, the vehicles are going to have to park if there are? Issues getting the food and delivery at the pickup window. Where are they parking? Where are the, the staff to come out and deliver the food? If it's not ready? I don't believe we have any specific spaces designated for that, um, but I'm sure that they would be able to pull around to one of these spaces, and then some staff member could come out and bring bring something to them. But we don't have any specific, you know, designated, you know, pickup spaces like some some uh, some users do. anywhere from about you know right around here here over you'll be able to you know back out and come straight back out to the light if you were parked in one of these spaces you would have to back out and circulate around the building to come out was there an assumption about a specific number of employees in relation and how many parking spaces they would have i know we haven't had that for the uh, for the Taco Bell, Bell or for the yeah, I mean, how much is that based on how many parked? So, so we did our parking um, study just based on the existing conditions. You know, assuming that you know the number of employees they have there today will be similar to the number of employees in the future. Even if we'll, even if the employees were to increase by you know one or two or maybe even three or four, there's more than enough parking. That even if each of those additional employees needs their own space to accommodate them. Um, but I do believe that you know the parking numbers will be similar to what's already what we observed out there today uh, for the existing facility. Behind the uh, menu boards, what what would you say is the typical? I mean, when you have a single lane, not dual lane. How many, how many vehicles are typically parked behind the menu boards? So, uh, behind the menu boards, that really can vary. Standard. It varies more based upon the layout of each individual site. What I normally like to see for a fast food restaurant is a minimum of, you know, 12. Um, the ability to stack 12 vehicles from the pickup window back to the entry point to the drive through lane, wherever that may be, regardless of the entry, uh, regardless of the menu board itself. Um, that's well, what I look for. My only concern is, and you know, it's not to discuss this during the concept meeting. I drive down that road all, every night, and I haven't seen it lately, but they're, you know, probably last year sometime, I would drive by there frequently, and the vehicles would be stacked up almost coming to the traffic light. There was so much use. Um, so now you, you are having dual lanes, and so that, that, that's going to help the situation. Um, but now it just seems um, a concern, or it's a concern for me based upon what I've seen. Um, I got, you know, 
we'll, I guess we'll see. You know, I, and I asked for the contact whether there's going to be additional employees to help um, help the ordering go quicker. <coughs> and you mentioned the, uh, the the small menu board would help, I guess, with that. Yeah. Um, but I think the answer was during the contest we knew that there wasn't additional employees necessarily. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so I, I don't know about the employees. I can tell you I've had several fast food type facilities where we had issues with staffing relative to, you know, the fact where a lot of those restaurants were going, to, you know, they were closing their interior seating areas, um, especially in 2020 and 2021, um, you know, middle, or early to middle 2021. Um, and we had issues, you know, where they're, you know, 100% through the drive through lane, so they were having problems with staffing coming out. Um, but again, we were there in October. We were there on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, we did extensive parking counts. Uh, we didn't see anything beyond 15 total vehicles uh, at that location um, during all of those times. Uh, and I do believe that you know this layout and this this operation um, you know, can accommodate the need for this use. Was the uh, <clears throat> square footage of seating in the facility did it, uh, maintain the same square footage, or did it shrink? <clears throat> The overall building footprint for the Taco Bell has, has reduced. I don't know how, if there's, a, if there's a difference in the patron area from the existing building to the future building as far as the square footage of that. But the overall building itself has reduced uh, in size from the existing building. Wait, no, I only asked because there's also an outdoor patio area as well. Yeah, there's a small outdoor seating area. Right, so they're putting two, two together space inside shrank, including with the parking spaces that shrank, or it grew because there's now a patio at the location that most people are sitting and eating at a patio. Uh, we can address that as part of the operational discussion later. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions for Mr. Rosewood? So just um, for the first things first, I mentioned in my opening comments that there's that the building was going to be constructed sort of to make the operation more efficient as it relates to the drive-through. Can you briefly speak to that? Uh, yes. Yeah. So the, the prototype building that we're building now has uh, 52 seats inside, uh, and then the patio seating, which we're in the Northeast. It's not used all the time, obviously, except for this winter, <laughs> clearly. Uh, but um, most of the uh, redesign of the building has to do with the back of the house. So we, right now, we don't really use the pay window and the and the pickup window as much. This is now because of the double drive-throughs, which we're adding to all our stores uh, that we rebuild at all our new stores. We add the double drive-through. The pickup window is being utilized. Uh, let the people are going to be about the same. Our max on any ship might be five or six. And uh, as Nathan mentioned about um, you know, the parking, we have a lot of young kids. Most of them don't necessarily drive themselves. Uh, they get dropped off, whatever. So uh, we don't have you know, six people driving the cars and parking in the parking lots. But the, most of this is more operational, back of house, wider aisles, adding you know, lines for production and those kinds of things not seating because we don't use as much seating anymore. Uh, and so, with, and with the dual drive-through, so essentially two two customers coming to the drive-through, you can order at once, right? Correct. correct. And these back of the house improvements are going to uh, to allow for those two orders to be processed at the same time. Correct. Okay. So, so essentially, more orders can get processed in less time. Yes. With these improvements. Okay. Um, and I mentioned, I think. Uh, Mr. Cleary also mentioned that the vast majority of the business comes through the drive-thru, is that right? 
Yes, yes. Yeah. obviously with COVID, we, we saw all that, we were closed inside, uh, but uh, we're probably, I think Brian said 80, 85, that, that's consistent with what we're seeing. And, uh, and we operate uh, 185 stores <laughs> in six states. So, uh, you know, and, and like I said, we're doing this at all of them now, where we can. And, and so you're doing this, you're, you're adding this dual drive through and adding these operational efficiencies to, Correct. I mean, be, because that helps to support the business that you're actually seeing. And I mean, the, these improvements um, <coughs> help, you know, push the business up through the drive through because it needs to go through it, right? I mean, Correct. It, okay, so, I mean, it's enough to accommodate out of demand. Yes. Okay. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of, uh, just about some of the basics. Like, Hours of operation for the Taco Bell. How are they going to be? They'll be exactly what they are today. I believe that this store is 8 a.m. till midnight inside, and then they close the inside, and the drive throughs typically open till one during the week and then two on the weekends. Okay. And so, and so no change no. to the hours of operation. The only one change could be if the breakfast business picks up, like they might open earlier, some of them open at seven, but okay. this one's at 8 a.m. <laughs> Um, and you mentioned um, no proposed change for the number of employees, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, the retail space, uh, uh, Brian mentioned it could be a cell phone store, uh, for example. It's not set in stone at this point, right? Yeah, we, we've, we own uh, probably 80% of our properties, okay. and as we're developing new ones, we're you know, buying larger parcels if it's required. We already own this, there's little space. Uh, we're going to put a pad in there, obviously some extra income for the, uh, the ownership side of the house and not the operational side. So. <clears throat> but, but I, I don't know who it is. I don't, we, you know, we'll have to market it and see who we can find. Right. But so, that's what I anticipate, something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think those are all the questions I had for you, unless the board or professionals have Well, you mentioned uh, the, the, oh. the, the, all the loading and all that. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yes, thank you. Again, we operate this restaurant today. To my knowledge, there's no issues. The township can probably let us know that. There were. Uh, trucks are doing the same thing now that they're going to do then. You know, then they pull in, they sit in front of the, uh, the building. There's a, a door, uh, a man door that they load through, and then they circulate around the building. So it'll be exactly as it is today. I can tell you I've never seen a truck driver. Yeah, yeah, it's because they go at 3 a.m. <laughs> and, you're, and you're not going to be out there. Yeah. And, and same with trash. Again, it's our, it's our, you know, our haulers. They're doing what they're doing today. All right, Joe, those are all the questions I have for you. So you're confirming the testimony about the fee? Cor correct. Five minutes for please uh, stand, state your name, and add just for the record. Carolyn O'Neill, 720 Holly Lane, bottom of the mount. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else? Absolutely. So on all these plans, it's always unclear how well the retention pond is going to handle the water if it's more than just an average storm. And since we're prone to nor'easters, that water winds up in my basement because we have many non-functioning retention ponds. So I want to know how at least for the Taco Bell piece, for the non 